Mm -hmm. All right. Before we get into our intro here, we'll go over the Mike Driscoll Python pop quiz for the month. I think we talked about this one a little bit. Uh, I think we definitely got a clear answer in the chat, uh, but we can talk about it a little bit. Uh, I'll pull up a REPL so we can go through it. But, but before we type it out, um, so we've got a class definition here for the dog object, and then we've got the initialization function, and we've got some local variables. Color, the color is notably a dender, whatever, underscore, underscore, uh, and the hair is a regular one. And we're wondering, when you print this object for the color um, value, what do you get? Half of our options are errors. One's none of the above. Someone said blue. Um, I think if it was not underscore, like the dunder thing, uh, double underscore before color, it, that might be true. Um, but let's switch over real quick to REPL and we'll, we'll run it. I mean, but you could reference that from within the class, right? The same method. That's the idea, but not outside of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got, what was it? That's my thing. Uh, as class dog. Wait, I think we just, no, there's no parameters. All right. And then definition. And then when we're initializing it, we are self gender. And I don't even know why I'm doing this, but I'm even going to touch that, but that's okay. All right. And then so someone said, this value should be stored, but only referenceable from within the class. And so trying to reference it from outside, we get, looks like C attribute error. So let's see, just to play around with that, if we had done uh, the hair, you do get long. So the dunder thing makes that a private Thing? Is that what you were saying, Robert? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, not so much private as uh, I think the official oh. word is mangled. The oh, name well, mangled. You, can't, you can't call it outside of the same method. So yeah. So it's its name, the, the dunder, the single dunder before the name as opposed to dunders before and after the name creates what's called name mangling. He has and so therefore you cannot be recognized you cannot be recognized from outside the class as everybody's saying also just so everybody knows dunder stands for double underscore which i Ooh. just this second <laughs> yeah but it's also confusing because you, you would normally pronounce the second line of code dunder init uh, mm -hmm. whereas this only has dunders as a prefix to the name the identifier right Tricky, tricky, Mike Driscoll. Good stuff. Come talk to us about John Deere. Mike Driscoll, good guy. Mm. All right. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's April 4th. Who knows what episode of SACPI this is. Uh, it was started by this guy, Josh Miller, back in 2017. I think it was a February. Generally, be cool. Uh, this is the code of conduct for our parent organization, SACTEC. And we haven't had any issues in a while, so I won't do a full read through. But generally, uh, we encourage participation. So don't hold your questions till the end. We like inline conversation. And, um, you know, if you're feeling shy and you'd prefer to be called on, you can raise your hand or use the chat. Or if you're, you know, decent at the timing, just drop in. But no sound bombing, please. You've been warned. 
I'm going to edit it out anyway, if there's anything not worth keeping. So just mess with the flow. Ooh, some updates here. Like I said, SAC Tech, it's a parent organization. They got a Slack channel. You can find them at sactech.com with the dash between the SAC and the tech. And, uh, we also have a Discord channel that's run on uh, my company's server, Brazen Studios. You can get there by uh, www.sacpy.org and that'll invite you into the SACPI channel. Or you can take a screenshot of the QR codes. Mm. Guess you'd have to take a picture of the screen. Or can you uh, can you access a QR code from an image editor on a thing? Mm. I don't know. Probably. Seems, probably, yeah, right. And yeah, we're on Twitter. I tweet a little bit. I didn't tweet so much in the last month, but sometimes I tweet a lot. Anyway, it exists. We exist on Reddit. Um I don't know if now that Reddit's IPO, I'm more or less uh, scared of Reddit. Because <laughs> every time I've posted there, it's led to Zoom bombing. It's it's the beginning of the death of, of Reddit. Yeah, right? 100%. End shitification. End stage. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, just it's right in time, right? Like all this uh, Gen AI stuff, and then it's the only good, only well moderated community on the internet. Cause... Let's go back to IRC. It, nice. Oh, we should set up a sack by IRC. We got some Facebook groups and pages and stuff. And well, Twinkles is uh pecking at the screen with the QR code. So she's a fan. Oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Maybe Twinkles can just like navigate to the the link through the QR code. No, that's that's not likely. We also have a YouTube channel where we publish our exports from these meetings. Some good stuff in there. We had a couple of good ones. We did Python in a nutshell, folks, last year. Mm -hmm. NumPy guy, too. So, Travis. All right, now is the time to turn on your camera. <laughs> get some screenshots for the next round of Brady Bunch photo. I need to sit down and... Well, I need to finally make a... I should probably make a script for this. In and, Python. Yeah, I've been just using an image editor, but at this point, yeah, do it in Python. Uh, well, tonight's about Python image imaging library, so. All right, I'm going to drop the share. Ooh, don't turn off the call. That'd be bad. Whoa. Oh, whoa, Twinkles is in our face. Twinkles, you're out of, you're out of focus. All right, everybody. But try to look intelligent. Nice. Oh, you're killing it, Twinkles. All right, nicely done. Okay, so before we get into this evening's um, presentation, it's time of month. Okay, did I do this right? I don't think I did this right. I'm going to need a new share. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, the background. So four times a year, I do a quick update on things that are going on in the Brazen Studios world. This is going to be the fastest one yet. And why? Well, I can't talk about it. All right. Up next, we got Tanim's going to show some cool stuff with the Python imaging library. All right. Um, oh, how do I uh, share certain things? Uh, do you need to hand me the ball or something? I always forget this. Yep. Hot potato. It's on to you. All right, let's do this. Uh, start the share, and it's tell me which ones I can share. One, uh, two, one, two. Wait, wait. How do I do this? One, two, and also here. Share those three things. So, you see this command line thing? I just press clear, right? I see things. And you see this? Uh, this thing here, the I, the keynote presentation. So I'll start off with this. Um, I was feeling more snarky than usual because crap doesn't work, you know, <laughs> at the place I work. And so I just decided to uh, put out this uh, 
this uh, yet another thing on the outside of my office door. It's one of the funniest scenes from uh, Kids in the Hall. And if you know where I work, it's kind of ironic because I work in a limited area. You're not allowed to bring in your phone or any kind of recording device that's recording at least video. So of course I put a QR code to the YouTube clip, which is here. And I was thinking, you know, uh, a few days ago, I was brainstorming, well, maybe I'd like to create some kind of a, you know, a business card or one of those things I can share. Or maybe I want something that's like metal, but with a cool color and a design on it. And so I thought, what color should I make it look like to, you know, make some kind of cool thing, at least cool to me. And I, I asked some friends around, how do I do this in some tools they use, like Adobe Acrobat or, I don't know, I actually don't know anything about, you know, uh, uh, you know, image editing tools that you have to pay money for. And they're like, yeah, I think you can do this in Adobe Illustrator, but I don't know how. Uh, so I thought, well, actually, you know, there's a neat Python module called Pillow, which is the son of uh, the successor to something called PIL, the Python image library. In fact, you import it the same way. And one of the nice features is you load the image of a lot of different kinds of formats, PNGs, JPEGs, TIFFs, some other stuff. I don't think the vector formats like PDFs or SVGs. Uh, and uh, one of the nice things is it'll give a NumPy array representation of all the pixels in that image. So, you know, the X first dimension is the X coordinate. The second is the Y coordinate. And the third, fourth, and fifth are uh, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. It's actually a, um, a three-dimensional array. The, the last four indices would be uh, the they would be the RGB alpha value of that pixel. So at this point, uh, you want me to get to it? If if anybody wants, <laughs> I guess if you have your phone, this, this is an opportunity to take the picture to see what I'm talking about, what I have on my office door. But with that, uh, I'll tell you, show you basically how I got from this to this all in Python. And Woody, I think you've used um, some of my tools that use the Python image library underneath the hood, right? Yeah. Like the, the thing to right. automatically crop images. Yeah. I use that all the time in my work and not work because I'm surprised a command line tool like that isn't just out there in the wild. It's incredibly useful. I mean, couldn't you use FFmpeg for that or is that just for videos? A what? Couldn't you use like FFmpeg to like crop crop that kinds of stuff? Yeah, I guess you can, but it's really overkill. You might be able to. Yeah. It's uh, basically you just take the uh, the first uh, you know first um, non white pixel and the last non white pixel in X and Y, and those are your basically your bounding box, mm -hmm. and then just create a new image where. That's what it is. That's all it conceptually is, you know, underneath the hood. So with that, I guess I could go to uh, using the Python image library to take stuff in as NumPy arrays and uh, do a little data science application too. So this is also an application of showing the uh, indexing and assignment you can do with NumPy. Uh, rather than something you try to, uh, you know, use the standard Python for loop syntax. So with that, here we go. So here's the initial image, you know. Can you guys see what I'm doing right now? Mm -hmm. There we see your Jupyter notebook. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to see if I can just... Uh, create something like a uh, image that from array, this image initial that show. Let's see if this works. Do, 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 do. Yep, 
Okay. It's also a nice functionality in the pillow that it does this sort of thing. Excuse me, I have to, my parent is trying to take a, you know, uh, pop some keys out of this keyboard. So I've got to close it. Dad twinkles. <laughs> she really is a toddler. She's uh, basically, uh, as soon as I'm not paying attention, she tries to misbehave. And it's actually a laptop I'm taking on work travel with me. So I think I don't want it to show up at my office with stuff, some keys popped out of it. No? Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Yep. So here's, uh, I think we've just gone here. Let's go. This is the thing. This is the, uh, do you see this command here that I did? NumPy.where? Sure. It's a fun way of, you know, basically identifying uh, the, the elements of the NumPy array that fit some properties. In this case, I'm just saying all the, all the uh, pixels in the initial image that are white. And as you can see here, there's some uh, detail in here that I found out when I, right before I talked to Woody is the way it works is, you know, it's a three-dimensional array, uh, you know, 39, 27 pixels horizontally or 50, 18 vertically, or I forget which one. Maybe this is vertical, this is horizontal, and this is the RGBA, you know, values. Hence, you know, the syntax that looks like this. And the thing that at least I noticed eventually is, you know, basically, uh, it repeats the you know horizontal and vertical coordinates repeat every four times. They're duplicated every four times for each of the first, the R, the G, the B, and the A. So we just take that and take something that's uh, you know, indices y, x, y, zero, c twelve, indices y, x, y, one. Okay, here we go. Stuff that's now, uh, you know, we're able to say, okay, uh, now we basically have, you know, all the indices that are identified that are not white. And let's confirm for ourselves how many are actually not are, are white. Okay. All right, so zero, right? And now we say, what was it? How many pixels are there total in the image? It's just the how many pixels in X times how many pixels in Y. So the nice value, this number is less than that number. Let's just verify that for ourselves. Cool which is what I kind of want, you know, at least a necessary condition to verify I'm not doing something obviously wrong. Yeah, doo -doo -doo -doo. And let's see what happens. Uh, you remember this first image that we showed here? Let me just put that up again. The image I loaded up. Oh, do you guys see this by the way or not? Sorry. I see the Jupiter notebook. I don't, I don't see the image anymore. Oh, okay. Let me actually, that's, uh, let me fix that. Let me just actually share the screen. Is it fine if I stop the share and start it over again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So it's one of those, yeah, let me just share the whole screen. So this is, uh, yeah, sorry about the confusion. <laughs> no worries. No, we so can. yeah, this is the initial image, right? Yeah, we get the QR, each day is a gift, and we got weird black and white guy uh-huh and let me show this one here do, 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 do. yep i know it's a uh, kind of a bad contrast but it's uh basically saying everything that was you know white in the initial image turn into blue and uh right now uh the way it works i actually have a method in this uh, this uh, code with pill that I have, 
that's just a quick way of, you know, a shortcut to say, uh, just identify the indices and just create an image of just those indices you've identified. <clears throat> All right, okay. It turns out that this isn't necessary, but you could go through the same, you know, operation here. And you wanna just say all the all the pixels that are not white, what do they look like? Yep. Works a little better. Or, you know, I think in hindsight, maybe this looks a little nicer to me. <laughs> and now finally, it's one of those things. Okay, now I've created in in some sense, I've identified the final image I want to create. Here's just how to create, how to go the in the other direction. Okay, here's a NumPy array, where now we say, initially make it all white. You there's uh, actually a bunch of different methods. Uh, there's an image color module that you can get the RGBA you know values of a given color, you can give it a name, you can give it its hex representation. A and is it'll just alpha, right? Yeah, this last one is it. So is like alpha. Maybe for transparency or whatever. Mm-hmm. Word, sorry. See, the nice thing about this, do you see what I did here? Um, this is more of this, uh, you know, NumPy uh, vector operations. In this case, it's uh, a vector operation of quickly indexing them and assigning a value to them. I, I timed it out when I just did a for loop, but by basically for you know any index value whose value is this and y value is what value is that, you know, explicitly set that, you know, uh, Entry by entry, it's it's uh you know value color to this RGB alpha color, and I think that took like uh, two and a half three minutes to do. Wow! Finally, here's that thing I showed. Oh wow, it's a little, kind of looks a little uh light colored, but let's see what it looks like in the end. And let me finally, let's see what it looks like. <laughs> Four. Uh-oh. <laughs> so this is another thing, I guess. Uh, it's one of those things where it looked fine on my work laptop and kind of looks more interesting on my personal laptop, MacBook. So here's what it's supposed to look like. Let me show that to you. This color, uh, but since I'm not a professional, I guess, uh, graphics designer, it's one of those things I guess I can iterate on a little more to get something that looks a little nicer. Yeah, and so- like The alpha was off, I think. <laughs> I mean, you ran the same code in your work laptop, right? So why is it different? I have no idea. This is the first time I'm seeing it. I didn't do the uh, the uh, tests on the on this personal laptop uh, before I gave the presentation. It's one of those things that uh, requires more testing. So short TLDR, I don't know. <laughs> That's but conceptually, cool. it's probably one of those things that uh, at least you start and you ident. It's uh, it seems a lot like oh well, I guess I have to choose another color or do some other opera, some post processing, to getting to get it look more like this uh, rather than you know uh, rather than that, which is really 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 you know, very low contrast uh, between white and not white. Oh, well, lesson learned, but yes. Oh, image magic. Actually, it's a good thing. Uh, yes, I've used that before. I don't know if, is there an auto crop functionality in image magic? 
I, I think so. Is there cropping built into this library? I'm looking at the library and looking at the modules associated and they have like all kinds of stuff that we can move things around. It looks like, and, and process images, heights and widths and all that. So probably. So what, how would we use this like professionally, like in a project is my first question here. Like, how does this kind of come into place? So maybe you're making an app that has to process images and, you know, change things about them. Right. 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 I mean, yeah. uh, I know I use autocrop image, which is mm -hmm. a, Python executable I implemented mm -hmm. um, to do that stuff all the time. Like there's too much white space. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just prop out all the white space and voila. Cool. Something that, you know, fits more easily but with a lot less manipulation in say my presentations or uh, if I put it to my documentation, LaTeX nice. or Sphinx or whatever. And that's preferable to calling like an outside tool from your perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I auto crop image. I mean, it's just a very simple thing. You give it in an input file. If you leave out the input file, if you leave out the output file, it'll just replace the input file with something that is, uh, you know, automatically cropping out the whites. Very cool. I mean, I'm sure it's possible elsewhere, but. I don't know why somebody has it made or something like this. <laughs> Sounds like it's something for you to uh, make and distribute. <laughs> well, actually I did. Uh, it's uh, it's on GitHub actually. Oh, cool. Or the Python module of which autocrop image is one of the executables I have. Is that the one on PyPy here that I'm looking at? I don't think it's on, or if it's on PyPy, it's not something I put on PyPy. It's, mm. uh, where is it? Uh, maybe Ivani. I think this is the, uh, I guess the youth, it's the everyone. Here's that URL. Cool. And there's also uh, something I'm using more and more often, which is to uh, programmatically uh, create and send out rich HTML emails um, using either the underlying SMTP server. I use that mode at work or uses uh, Google, I guess the Google email API to distribute it. So one of those two ways. So this kind of started as a personal project to scrape. It looks like NPR. <laughs> yes, yes. It was a lot carrier dependencies, but this was the stuff that, you know, doesn't rely, rely on that, all that other stuff. But uh, other right. people have said they find it useful. Like, I think, Woody, you mentioned you've used it a little bit, I think. Yeah, I've poked around with all the stuff you've shared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's also some people at work who, you know, imported this Python module, you know, for for their work, you know, because of tooling like this. I think they use it at an API level, uh, less than the you know, just uh the command line tools. Cool. But it's but it's just that stuff that uh, you know it actually there's some Sphinx documentation behind it. I can show. Cool. I definitely recommend publishing this in PyPy. Uh, you could do it on my behalf. I don't really care. <laughs> oh, you want more people to use it. <laughs> it's easier. I'm, I'm fine with either, you know. Mm. Uh, one way or the other, it doesn't really matter to me. It's just uh, a lot of the time I make this documentation for myself, too, so that I have a an easily, I, you know, identifiable place where I can, you know, figure out this stuff. Plus... If I put it on PyPy, right, people will tell me uh, you're doing it wrong or they'll. Uh... Oh, they'll tell you that anyway. It's on GitHub. There's an issues button right there. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. I mean, uh, I don't want to make it too visible. I don't want to get bothered too much. <laughs> oh, that's how great tools start. <laughs> that's probably it. Yeah. This is awesome. So that's the long and short of it. I mean, there's a. Uh, there's a zip archive of this presentation if people just want to see what I what it's supposed to do. And uh, there's a Jupyter notebook and it's all self-contained. 
Uh, Tony. Yeah. Um, you, you've you've talked about picking up everything from the image that's not white. Uh, yeah. Just just thinking for a moment of of the system that Woody's using. He he's obviously got a some sort of a picture of his background, and then he's standing he's standing in front. So there's some software which is separating the foreground from the background. Uh, will, yeah. will this will this package do that, or does it work with specific colors? No, could, it could works with specific have... colors, and yeah, it's right. made it you very have to do edge detection for that. So yeah, there's image detection. Maybe there's stereoscopic detection to see it. It thinks you're only so far away, or this part of, I guess, the middle ground is so far away. And everything it thinks is closer, it actually shows as the yeah. as the foreground image, the person, and everything further away goes into the background or something. Oh. Like I'd be like well, OpenCV I, I, or something like that. I was, <laughs> uh -huh, right, yes. It's probably a different tool, isn't it? So, so I mean, looking at Woody's... Um, small picture at the moment if you took a picture of that background the sack pie etc assuming it's actually on the wall which i suspect is not <laughs> but if you took a picture of the wall behind him and then you take a picture of woody with the wall behind him and you do a subtract so you subtract the wall image from the live image mm -hmm. you would just be left with you would just be left with woody wouldn't you that's the, the using that um matrix uh, calculation you were showing us a moment ago. Maybe uh, there's some kind of vectored operation uh, yeah. happening in the hardware. I'm not sure, actually. I guess yeah. it's... Oh, look, somebody's, on... oh. somebody's got something. Yeah, RemBG. Yeah, I would use OpenCV for that. That's exactly what it's designed for, are those types yeah, of yeah, operations. Absolutely. And that and that is based on NumPy and these, these same libraries we're using. So Very good. Much, much smarter than us has already put all this stuff together. <laughs> hey, I, I've got a question. Is this um, library you developed, does it work well with TensorFlow? Because I could imagine that this mm. image processing would be useful if you're doing um, computer vision. I guess there's OpenCV stuff. That, OpenCV you know, is, uh, is the answer for that, for sure. That's the combination. There's Pi Open CV, you know, I, I don't know what sort of connection uh, uh, you'd use to TensorFlow or Torch. Uh, presumably, it might be as straightforward as, you know, one of the uh, methods that uses, uh, that Torch would use at a high level would be an import Pi Open CV, something like that. Uh, yeah, but of course, the proof is in the pudding. These are all sort of complicated structures, and it's worth running it or testing it to see what's happening. It's also a big difference whether or not you want to do it in real time, which is what OpenCV is geared towards. Okay. Yeah, this is they're all these people are all doing way more complicated methods to remove these, remove the backgrounds and find stuff. They're doing edge detection, they're doing Gaussian blur, they're doing a bunch of different like, you know, types of algorithms to figure this one out. <laughs> Because hmm. if you just if you just, if you just, just look for pixels that are different, you're gonna get like a very like you know uh, sharp sharp contrast and things will be cut out, right? So you need you have to like have like you know a little bit of like an edge to everything. Oh. I'll, I'll say for um, I have been using OpenAI's Whisper mm -hmm. uh, Python module for basically creating really high quality subtitles for movies that I have. That's a giant fucking library. <laughs> wow. Well, that is pretty big. Wow. How many gigabytes is it? it looks like it's like oh, no, no, it's, megs. oh, it's just slowly downloading. Okay. It's all this stuff is huge because they include a ton of dependencies. That's why. So yeah, I think it's also going. So, oh, no. <laughs> TensorFlow, <laughs> OpenCV, all this stuff. There's a ton of like libraries that are downloads in the background to interact with the GPU specifically. Oh, yeah. What are the libraries used for? It's to interact directly with the GPU and do image processing that way. So as far as I know. It's mm -hmm. off it's for yeah. offloading your work, basically. 
<laughs> All right, I'm trying to pull up a decent. I could use a either use a GPU or a botnet, right? Uh, I guess the GPU is being a better citizen. <laughs> yeah, your CPU is very slow, you know, so your GPU can do operations like this a lot quicker. So yeah. But I was thinking also, uh, constructor, you know, go construct a botnet to offload work to that. Is there is there <laughs> some? That's what Spark is for. <laughs> <laughs> so I use Spark professionally to do that. Exactly that. Is do you have an example of this um, package, this Python library implemented with Spark? Uh, mm. Not off the top of my head. I mean, I could. Probably I mean, find one, but I mean, Spark is. I guess in Spark you'd have some Python modules, right? Or well, Spark is Spark just is a... just the. Is it an engine or a or a sort of a distributed? Got uh, it partition so apache spark is a distributed job engine that you can implement with any kind of like you know anything on top of it like kubernetes or whatever else you want to use to actually schedule oh. the, jobs, the nodes and all that i use kubernetes for it but spark is just a generic processor to say hey i have these jobs that can work in parallel i want you to send the one of them to each node and have them come back to me that's what that's all it is it's a way to distribute workloads to multiple machines so it doesn't really care about what it's running it is it's a way to distribute them to different machines and nodes okay so yeah, we use it for data processing, like the data science stuff, like just like Python jobs that run basically and then write to a database, but it just like sends them to a bunch of different nodes. Oh, it's pillow, not PIL. Pip3 install pillow. I think that should work. And you, it looks like you already have it. It's but, weird. Pillow replace PIL. Okay, so do I need to update this. This should be pillow. No, no, this is correct. You're actually correct. Okay. This is oh, okay. the confusion is pillow uses the same api as pil oh. and it even has the same name at the level of it's still from pill and port image so when it says pill it's actually pillow Do a thing. Let's do it a thing. Maybe. Oh, remove Same. background. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, obviously. It depends on how many modules you want to install. Yeah, right. Wow. Okay, so that should have given us uh oh wait, no, it's still going. Is it a yeah, I guess it's probably trying to compile well, the I code. Yeah, let's look at what it was doing, because it was it was, wait, why am I not? Oh, the reason it was, yeah, that's where we were looking at. Mm -hmm. So it is opening it in Python imaging library, and then it's generating a NumPy array. And then with that NumPy array, that's how you, like that is what remove background utilizes. I Nobody, guess so. It was this picture that I gave it. From what was it doing? Is actually What's the RenBG? I don't see a RenBG anywhere in here. Oh, there it is. RenBG dot remove. Okay. Yeah, this part. Oops. Don't do that. Oh no, get bigger. There we go. Okay, I think I sent it the right twinkles, right? Twinkles. <laughs> Try to run it without any input or output. Oh yeah. Uh, yo, oh, it's doing something. It's oh, 176 damn. megs. <laughs> it's probably actually installing a crypto miner on your machine right now. Yeah, yeah. RemBG, it's doing all that stuff. Wow. I don't know about that one. See, this is a little uh, inefficient, but okay. I wonder if it uh, sends it out somewhere for processing and then it comes back. <laughs> uh, it seems a little sketch. Uh, I think we're going to abort on that one. <laughs> Dan, uh, what's a crypto mod used for again? Crypto miner, <laughs> like it's like mining crypto in his machine. <laughs> yeah, so like utilize my internet connection and my my computer too. Yeah, what's well, so what's this? You know, run random code from the internet. It's always fun. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'm gonna allow 176 megabytes to download. Um, yeah. After the fact. 
a little sketchy. All right. Well, anyway, uh, cool. Well, that's always awesome tools to name. Um, I think we can very cool into uh, packaging. If you guys know a place where I can uh, give them an image and to make some kind of colored embossed, I guess. What would be cool is to use your library to make a little flask app or something and like a little, it's like small, like web application and then have like an input and output button and just kind of use that for like a demo to get people to use it maybe, or just. Oh, like I did it. have a demo where I did that. It yeah, was cool. uh, demonstrating uh, web apps, uh, which was, remember the Ashley Madison hack? Oh uh, yeah. You? Were, you, were they like, all the like contact info was released? That's Very similar right. to the thing so that I, I found, uh, actually. Downloaded a torrent of the hack and just focused on the emails. So it was sort of an icebreaker at my 20th high school reunion where <laughs> this was a Flask app that hosted basically a website. You, uh, you know, it asked you for your Google contact credentials, you know. It was a quick way to learn, you know, Python web app programming. Um, as yeah. well as an introduction to OAuth too, and how Google does credentialing through you know its Python API. So right, it asks for your permission. It'll just scour your contact information and essentially did a set operation on the <laughs> database. If you're in it. And then so it, what I heard it was back uh, which contacts it found on the database. So it was a nice way of seeing who we knew. From our twentieth high school reunion, did you, uh, did you present on, this publicly at the reunion? <laughs> well, it was a nice demo. You know, it was hosted on my server upstairs. <laughs> but you know, a Flask app with a in in Nginx reverse pro proxy, right? Mm -hmm. So cool. <laughs> that would definitely definitely be a memorable presentation. Yeah, it was. Like, might, they uh, might not invite you back. <laughs> <laughs> There are at least two very polar opposite camps, yes, at the high school reunion. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, a little intense on the ice breaking. Okay. This is a side of Tanima I wasn't expecting. <laughs> I, I, I remember, yeah, the ice breaking was my 20th high school reunion. So it was in 2017, fall of 2017. <laughs> So how many people uh, have been following the whole uh, XZ hack, <laughs> the library uh, injection, as I'll call it? <laughs> I've, I've heard stories about it. I checked my uh, Linux servers and uh, they're, they shouldn't be vulnerable because they're earlier versions of XZ and LZMA, 5.4.X. It's, it's so. one of the best industrial espionage stories that I've ever seen in my entire life because it was multiple years in the making, right? So this guy did commits for years like leading up to this. <laughs> I just, I can't even believe like the uh, the amount of like time that this guy put into this. So just a wild story. I mean, they're going to make a movie about this or something like. <laughs> is, the, is the XZ hack at all based on SQL injection? No. So the XZ hack is somebody that was contributing to the XZ library, which is a uh, compression library that was used for all kinds of stuff, right? So he was contributing for years and years and years. And he, he basically put a back door into it that was almost merged upstream into like all major distributions. And if they had been merged into more distributions, it basically would have said that, hey, if you have this particular private key and you're connecting to this server, it was an it was a vulnerability that was connected to SSHD, so it made SSHD vulnerable by having that library on your system. So just an absolutely wild supply chain hack. And the only way they found it was some random engineer, some nerd from Microsoft, was um, troubleshooting SSHD login times. And he was timing it, and he noticed it was slightly slower uh, when mm -hmm. using this library. So just random occurrence and like nobody really knew about it and they somehow just found it by the you know the good of the community basically right so it's a, it's a, it's a wild story <laughs> so in the, in his case people were happy that, that it was found yes 
hundred percent. I mean, and there's so much to this story, right? Was that guy from Microsoft really just like a random person or was he somehow connected to something bigger, like a state sponsored kind of situation and all that. And it kind of like ran through him or and like, how did this guy, like, who was this guy like contributing like for all of these years? Cause it wasn't just one guy. It was one guy contributing for years. And then a bunch of other profiles that came out of nowhere, basically pressure the maintainer of XZ to take it over and to like implement it upstream, you know? So it was a coordinated thing between like a larger group of people. And had this been merged into, you know, Ubuntu and Debian yeah. and all these other like, you know, repositories, uh, they would have, it would have made every single version of Linux out there vulnerable. <laughs> so. Wow. It's a absolutely wild story. <laughs> and also the bash script itself and all the code itself is fascinating to read. So with all the obfuscation and all the work put into it to go like, it, it was part of like the, uh, I think the build process, he kind of hit it in the build process to where you never even really notice it. It was hidden like in a check basically. Um, so you never even notice it. It's just wild. It's, it's amazing to like to look at. So it makes you to the NSA send them a message kind of gritting through their teeth saying, Thank you. Well, that's kind of like what we what we don't know, right? Was this the NSA like going through this dude from Microsoft or like it's probably a state sponsored hack? Like the the amount of like sophistication on this is just incredible and it's years in the making. <laughs> so for something like that, I wonder if it's the only like it, 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 it X what was it? X Y X Z was the one that was found. But if I'm if I'm going to be implement per but uh, you know, put on this persona for for years. Am I only going to do it for one library? Well, that library is used in everything, including SSHD, right? So it's a prime target for like a supply mm -hmm. chain hack, you know. And also, this shows the problem with open source and like hoping like that random people just find this stuff because how much of this has slipped through the cracks? You know, we right. don't know. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. a problem. Maybe we have lots of cell phones or just the one cell phone. <laughs> oh, Although man. they need to Three they just make us all vulnerable to each other. Stars have, oh no, as far as I'm concerned, all <laughs> Linux um, you know, distributions out there probably have back doors put into them by governments that we just don't know about. Zero days everywhere. Like there's no way we'd ever know. <laughs> so. Well, my machine seems to be running fine and you're fine. Given I what care. I do, there's no jackbooted thugs, at least uh, knocking on my door. So... It's just a, it's just a <laughs> wild thing to think about. And this isn't the first one, right? We've seen similar supply chain hacks like recently as well. People trying to modify packages used by other people for other things. You know, we, this is an ongoing problem that highlights the issue of open source software in general and how we deal with this as a community. And we don't really have a solution to it, right? So <laughs> why why are you why are you do you keep saying open source software? What makes you think that the NSA don't have a quiet chat to Microsoft or Oracle or Google or whoever? We don't uh, know. given given that those organizations yeah, well you keep saying open source um as opposed to proprietary. So I was just picking up on that because uh, remember that our friends at Google and Microsoft are only too happy to obey all sorts of legal uh, requests to provide private information or what we think is private. Well, XZ is open source. It's an open source library that's used, right? So, I mean, that's why I'm saying that. So, um, I think one flip side of that, though, that's interesting is that, um, to your point, it, this guy got pressured and for years they, was built, they were, you know, this guy was adding to it <clears throat> for like this final uh, this final moment, but because it was open source, some, uh, some guy found it and part, as part of the open source community and stopped it from getting put yeah, in. He figured so, out that on this on version, what side you're on on that, right? Yeah, yeah. Between these two versions, something changed that made SSHD slower for no apparent right. reason. Right. Yeah, half a second, <laughs> I think, or something like that is what he, yeah. he found and out. But, um, but, but to that extent, it was stopped because of it was open source, right? Because you have different eyes on it. And there was this one person who, yeah, you know, that's that's many. my point is that we were relying on like this like random one person out sure. there to find this stuff. Sure. If he hadn't found it, I mean, we're all if that's it. Like that would have been like the the crime of the century, right? <laughs> right, but he did though, right? So that's kind of the point of the open source, the protection of it. He got this happening. one. Yeah, this one, you're right. Yeah. No, I hear you. That's my point is that it's kind of scary to rely on the community, sort of, in a sense. And this goes back to the whole, you know. 
how we deal with like open source software versus private companies owning everything and not not having to be auditable. <laughs> Just some food for thought. Oh yeah, it's definitely a good topic. It's like having a thousand eyes that aren't paid versus a hundred eyes that are, you know. Um, sure. But less attack vectors on potentially those that smaller surface area. Yeah, and then you wonder what can you accomplish with five eyes. Right. Right, which is why you see so much open source to a degree for both those reasons. But obviously that's not why each day is a gift. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stay safe, people. If you anybody went to that URL. <laughs> I haven't I've went to it. I haven't I haven't got a chance it, to it's from the, from the chat. Is hacking illegal? Certainly not. Only if you use it for bad things. We're all hackers. We're all hacking on stuff all day long. <laughs> yeah hacking is just using something in an unexpected fashion or hacking is making something cool you know the origins of the hackers are people that are, there were makers the makers nowadays are, are you know what hackers used to be <laughs> fair so. enough yeah there, there's definitely a subset of hacking that gives all the rest of it a bad name yeah black hats you know basically people trying to like mess mess things up <laughs> hey so. i've got a question for everyone here do any of you use Python to control hardware? You know, like motors, H bridges, microcontrollers. I don't know too much about Python to do that stuff. Um, we've had some people that presented on running a ham radio antenna. Yeah, yeah. I think you have a recording of that, right? Yeah, that was Dan Quellen. I, I think ESP Home is based on Python, and I do use that. So I don't know if that counts. That's actually a good a good example of that. That was a good presentation. It was a few years ago. Yeah, that was, was a good cool presentation. Yeah. It was cool because you had like the Telegram bot, and then it ended in a, like hardware manipulation. Uh, yeah. what, are you, what are you working on, Wolfgang? Well, I have several things that I'm working on. Um, this is one thing I've built. It's a kit, but um, can, this is the Geiger counter. That's one thing I've built. That's oh, cool. nice. Um, I'm actually sitting in a home electronics lab right now, and I have these DC motors. Let me just take this thing. Like this, this things like this that I'm controlling with an H bridge and an AT tiny 85 microcontroller. Um, I have this chip programmer. I've got Arduinos and I've got a 3D printer, which is right here. So nice. I am currently, I found a, I used the library called, um, what was it called? Pi for Mata. And it allows you to program an Arduino with Python as long as it was connected to your computer. And I found it's quite useful for taking data in from a sensor, like a magnetism sensor. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering if anyone here has heard of Pi or if that I would, if someone would want to talk about that, I would hope that would be a talk in future. That's a great meeting. talk. Yeah. That yeah was I, think I suggest you, you do the talk if you want to. <laughs> I don't. Well, I, I, I don't, how would I, get in the list i mean i hardly this is my first time and i don't really know how this organization works could someone explain it please um you're in if you want to present uh let me know when you're free to present talk to woody and that's me don't arduinos uh don't they run c plus plus by like by default or c code or they run c. Is, well this <clears throat> is what i this is what i i know that and I I I put C code on the Arduino that talks to my Python mm. um, interpreter. Awesome. Um, it talks to my IDE, my integrated development environment. So then I can write Python code, including stuff with um, pandas, NumPy, and I can save data. I can put it in a nice Seaborn graph. Uh -huh. If you if you have you can if there's a package to control the FTDI cables the, the same way you would if you had C, right? Uh, then then just connecting to your USB cable to anything that that you would connect uh, the 
through the FDDI cable, it should should be able to. It's called Pyformata. I'm putting it in the ch chat. Okay. It's and I think mainly for Arduino's. Um, although I think it could work with other things. I don't think it would actually work out an offline microcontroller like the AT Tiny eighty five. I like the ATtiny tiny for 85 because it doesn't need any extraneous equipment. Okay. I mean, because yeah. it, it is just, I mean, it's just a few lines of, you know, the USB that needs to be controlled. Could you uh, send me the name of this thing so I can look up some more? Yeah. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. It's FTDI. FTDI. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a programming interface for, for a lot of uh, microcontrollers and embedded stuff. I, I believe there is a Python version. I, I just always use C for it, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was a Python version. <clears throat> Couldn't you, uh, would you be able to use a Raspberry Pi? Because don't doesn't Raspberry Pi allow Python and C++ kind of out of the box, kind of like our, our Arduino's more of the C++, would you be able to use that as a swap, swap out? And, kind of replace Arduino with the Raspberry Pi and still accomplish what you're trying to do by using the library? More of a question because I don't know, but. Well, I think to answer that I question, remember. I would at least think about it in terms of like how much hardware you're throwing at the problem. Raspberry Pi is like pretty. Built up compared to Arduino. Yeah, I mean, it's overkill for something mm -hmm. to be done with an Arduino. And then if you can do it right. with an Arduino, then you can do it with one of these smaller controllers too. Um, so like you're, you're not wrong raspberry pi is really interesting um kind of like smaller computing system that you do stuff with python on uh it sounds like wolfgang you're, you're probably tilting at like robotics and whatnot you're hoping to make some sort of thing that'll move around and do your bidding um, like that. <laughs> wolfgang you're muted i don't know if you're saying anything Oh, yeah. oh! I I've actually built several kit robotic arms. I'm really an electrical engineer. That's what my degree is. So that's kind of the angle I've been coming from. Oh, cool. Anything in particular? Or are you just like making stuff work? Well, I like aerospace. I'm very interested in that area. I was thinking of I I do model rockets too, and I'm thinking of making a computer controlled launch controller so that I can press a computer key. And then this is way beyond where I can, what I can do right now. I'm still improving my skill sets. I want to be able to have video transmitted via radio from a camera in the nose cone of a model rocket to my computer screen. Although I'm nowhere near that yet. Thanks. Nice. That's a good goal. Launch your rocket from the command line. And then my other question is, in general, I will tell you, I worked remotely before. What would be the best approach to take if I've had a few years of programming experience? I live in a remote place and I want to get a 100% remote programming job. Mm, well, I'd say first, make sure you've got some rel readily shareable portfolio of some of the things that you've done. Uh, might might be worth taking some time to find like, I don't know, say three projects to start that were, you know, you thought had interesting implementations and write like a little page. Um, on GitHub, you can host your own page for free uh, and you can do it in Markdown. Uh, you can also do a regular HTML page. Um, and so like get something up on your GitHub page for like a portfolio. And then I don't know where your well, is at, the, but maybe... I have a website, right? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I have a good. web. Build the portfolio. Like having something that can show what you've done is crucial. Uh, if you can make a video about it and put it on YouTube, that that goes that much further to adding some like richness to your um, to the experience for whoever's like going to be you know, going through and saying like, can Wolfgang do this job? Yeah, I think so. Well, why? Well, he did this thing with Arduino and then he did this thing with the rocket and this other thing. So 
let's give them a shot. Uh, but yeah, get your resume out there. Um, do you have a LinkedIn? If not, yes, I'm. I have LinkedIn and a website. Right now, I've got an LLC called Bibliocortex. I've oh, done cool. some. I've done some web development. I have a website www.bibliocortex.com with a few things on my GitHub page, but I'm going to. I, I'm building it up this year. It's not complete yet. Nice. Um, so and then to... one more question is spark a must have for python um well that's like the pi spark so like the apache spark thing yeah uh, that's what i'm learning yeah i i think it's it's valuable to know how to use uh distributed systems like that especially anything coming out of apache it gets pretty used, used pretty widely i wouldn't say it's a must have but I, for certain jobs, it'll be a must have, definitely. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for like looking up a particular tech because someone says like, hey, you know, we, we, we want to hire you, but you need to know how to use Apache Spark or something like that. And to be able to go, okay, I don't know that. Go hit Google or ask ChatGPT, what is PySpark or Apache Spark? And then be able to do like a hello world with it. Um, and then maybe do some sort of you know, recipe from some tutorial. That's awesome. Um, and then if you can build it into your own system, that goes a long way towards building your skill set as well as being able to build your portfolio and show that you can do it. Um, but for all jobs, no, definitely not a requirement, but for some, yeah, absolutely. Um, for example, I don't really know PySpark. Uh, or Spark, I guess the Pi Spark's the, the the library for it. But my understanding is uh, Spark is like a pub sub model, right? Where it's kind of like a flexible like mess or distributed system. Or no, you can implement a pub sub with it. I don't know. What's what's your area of expertise personally? Uh, me personally, um, I, so I came late into the engineering game. I worked a lot in like, um, user operations. So, and then I studied human computer interaction as a specialization for CogSci. So I kind of live in the like user experience space. Um, and then kind of working with engineering, I don't know, I guess I'm like a solution architect basically find a weird problem set and then come up with a novel solution and then prototype it. Uh, which I, which libraries do you use every day and which IDE do you personally use? Uh, I'll answer IDE first. Um, definitely Visual, Visual Studio Code, possibly because I'm locked into a co-pilot co uh, um, thing, uh, subscription. Uh, um, what libraries? I think I probably use Beautiful Soup more frequently than I'd like to, and basically every day. Because uh, much of what I end up doing, being a guy who's worked in the user experience space, um, who's now doing engineering, is I'll work with small companies. It'll be like a CEO or a sales team or something like that. And they'll say like, hey, we want to get all this information. Here's a website. You know, find us all the professional information on there because we want to work with the companies that are doing this particular type of work. Go get it. And so, you know, I'm I'm like slogging through some like web 1.0 website that's some de facto city system, but it's got all the information that's held by contractors. Um, and so I just end up wading through a whole bunch of like randomly generated human human generated data that's sort of digitized and then generate data sets. I do some other stuff too, but I, I guess I like to think of it, my problem solving in the, in the sort of like user experience first. Uh, I don't know if that's, that answers your question. Yeah, I've heard of beautiful soup. Um, yeah, it's good for like, if you're, if you're dealing with, um, like XML, HTML, uh, things like that. Because, uh, uh, yeah, 
the internet is a bunch of soup. It's beautiful soup in the end, but <laughs> when you look at the page source, it's it's soup. So I'm trying to go in the direction of um, data science and machine learning. What do you know about that region and what are the best, in your opinion, what are the best um, libraries or technologies to master for that? Oh, uh, Rob asked, while I answer this, could you share your LinkedIn slash GitHub? Okay. Uh, all right, so machine learning. Well, we're a Python group. Um, and it seems like the zeitgeist right now is all about PySpark. Um, you could look at a competitive thing, uh, TensorFlow, Google's tool set. Um, I still want to get good at that one. Um, I guess if you're going to be building models, that, that's maybe where you want to be. Um, these days, new models are coming out like several a day. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to like, are you familiar with Hugging Face? Yes, I've been there, but I've used the models, but I've never actually um, contributed anything to it or modified anything from it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's definitely a repository for what people are doing with machine learning. Uh, I wouldn't profess to know a lot about what's the latest and greatest, but I think it's a cool space to see what's what's performing well against various benchmarks. Uh, they have like a LLM leaderboard where they're constantly benchmarking updates. Uh, Sopa says you need luck to find a 100% remote Python job. I've been trying to get one of those for the last six months. Yeah, Sopa's, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, I think we're definitely in a weird spot with the market for a number of reasons. Um, there was a huge round of layoffs in the tech industry that started over a year ago or something like that, that I think was largely driven by tax bill that went through. And I don't think that's a bad thing on the long term, but in the short term, it affected the tech community. And the way I've seen that kind of played out on my end is, um, you know, I get a regular flow of recruiters saying like, hey, look at this job. And this overlaps with a few keywords or something like that. And definitely before the mass layoffs, there was a theme of like, you know, of roles being the primary inbound. But lately I've been getting lists of candidates of like people that was like, hey, I've got a list of a hundred people that all have all these skills and like, here's their stack rank of like their number of years of experience and all these things and from all these skill matrices and whatnot. Do you have any roles for them? So because of all the layoffs and whatnot, I think we're all kind of, if you're looking for something, you're all up against a whole bunch of people that are looking for things. So I don't think SOPAS is wrong. You just need a little bit of luck. Um, but uh, a little patience too. I think you got to also just keep... Uh, getting out there, keep talking to people. Um, if recruiters reach out on LinkedIn or on email, you know, send them an updated resume. Say, hey, yeah, call me. Send me a test or something. I'll pass your test. Um, hopefully this all turns around in coming years. Who knows? Maybe AI will take all our jobs and all we have to, all we have to gain from all of this is that we, we can all think like programmers, which might be a good thing in the world of, uh, LLMs and prompt engineering and all that. But who will, but won't there be a huge number of people making the AIs? <laughs> yeah, well, that's definitely where it's at right now. So I, I don't think you're in a bad spot trying to work on the, the machine learning. Uh, it's a, that's a golden skill set right now. So if you could do it, well, yeah, do it. I want to take it and then apply it to industries that I know that in engineering, there's a lot of things that aren't super computerized yet and i would i think that i could make money if i could turn um machine learning models into something that controls machines maybe in light industry small hmm. scale small scale industry nice interesting well yeah ai for everything or machine learning for everything is definitely 
that's what's raising the money in the venture capital space these days. So, yeah. Well, Wolfgang, there's. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, in LinkedIn, there's a number of groups for for machine learning, right? So you can join those groups, and you can uh, also and there's like different people to follow as well. Um, I'm I'm in some of those, right? Uh, and also, um, uh, we can send you a link for the um, uh, for the group that uh, uh, Nitin and I run. Um, but yeah, that's um, applying it to the um, machine and manufacturing space. I think is a really interesting area. My other question is: Does publishing a scientific paper get you a higher place in the? Yes. You. Yeah. Especially if you can, if you can get, if you can get a lot of citations for for a machine learning paper, I think that that, that puts you pretty high. Yeah. Play. How did How did you find out about this group? Um, I just looked online. Yeah. So in in uh, in Meetup, right? There's a, yes. there's a a group called the uh, mach either machine learning or deep learning uh, paper reading group in in the East Bay, right? So obviously, if you've written, if you have a, if you've published a scientific paper yourself, um, then automatically they would want you as a speaker, and um, yeah, that's that definitely gets you visibility. Well, my personal idea is this: I don't think I could create a new machine learning algorithm with my knowledge, but what I could do is. I could apply machine learning to an unexplored astronomy data set. Right. Things some I was thinking of one of the yeah. some of Kaga. the, the sky stuff. surveys. And then yeah. something so, like that. Could I, do you think that would be useful? Yeah. So the the uh, I think Robert was trying to say there, there's a uh, place called Kaggle.com where a lot of data sets are. Um, yeah, I've, I've been there. Yeah. And I, I, I think uh, and maybe some other people on here could, could yeah. elaborate. You can, you can find evidence on Kaggle. Uh, I yeah. found I found something that's more obscure on the NASA website called the Planetary Data System. And they have data that I think hasn't been touched by as many people. So if any of you are looking for that, I can send you that link if you want. If you want some data that may not have been I, I went on Kaggle, but what I'm thinking is that I don't want to just do a data set that I don't want to do the 10,000th analysis of the Titanic data set or. So what, what, what kind of, what's your math background? Uh, have you, you've had I'm a like... math, I was a math, I was a math minor. So okay, I've had calculus one to three differential equations, linear algebra, but no abstract math, really. I haven't done any proofs i've no, no, done no, that's that's yeah. to totally cool that puts you on par with everybody else right if, if, so, if you have linear algebra and calculus you basically have that. that's me yeah 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 that's that's the usual cs engineering background right that's uh, that's me yeah so you're good um yeah look into kaggle look into like the um uh, uh, the court. What, what's the name of the Coursera course? Uh, um, uh there, there's the deep learning specialization, which is a really yeah, good, that one. good launching point. Uh, if if you are more interested in the math, you could take the machine learning um uh, course as well. Just a little shorter. It's a little more theory involved, but uh, in terms of just getting you going on on actually building machine learning uh, things. Uh, deep learning specialization by Andrew Ring is, is probably the best one. Hmm. Well, thank you. Could you send me a link? I'd love to know more if it's. Um, yeah, I can. Send that link. You know, I heard NASA is trying to do a 
like a moon time zone thing or something like that. I just heard about that. Is the eclipse on Monday supposed to be visible for California? Or is that uh, yeah, a totality goes from like Texas and then kind of up the eastern seaboard. I think California will see the August one or something. Um, but we'll see some amount of it. I think we see like 80%, I believe it was. Yeah, the 8th. All right, Oscar's signing off. See you, Oscar. Cool. Well, I think we got that. That's about it for all the content tonight. Uh, th thanks for all your questions, Wolfgang. That was led to some good conversation. Assuming you're still here. Um, but uh, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank um, you, Mr. Hooten. Of course. Glad to have you. Um, hopefully, you, you show up in the future meetups. It was a fun chat with you. But I think I'm going to wrap it up. I here. will. I will. I'll. Great. Do you meet every month the same day of the week? Yeah. If you follow the group, uh, we will we'll post our updates. I'm I'm pretty on top of it, and uh, we usually have something interesting going on. So, um, yeah. all right, everybody. Well, thanks for showing up tonight, and uh, we'll see you in a month. All right. Cheers. See ya. Cool. Thanks, everybody.